Thank you. And it's uh, a great privilege to be moderating this opening session. And again, I echo the, uh, the congratulations of the Australian Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, uh, both to Global Citizen and FPCI. I know it's an extraordinary effort to pull all of this together. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, a panel of four very distinguished speakers uh, who will be joined shortly after by a panel of um, also very distinguished discussants. Um, but let me just say a few words about the purpose of this first session. Um, this global town of all covers uh, a very broad agenda reflecting the, uh, the range and the complexity of the challenges facing the world and the international community today. And in this first session, our four speakers will each have an opportunity to identify what they see as the main issues, the main challenges confronting the world based on events in 2023, but also looking to the longer term trends. I'm especially interested in this conversation in understanding how the risks and the trends and the opportunities intersect. So I'm sure we'll hear about issues to do with major power rivalry, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the, the brutality and disruption that that has brought to the fabric of the international system, but also the threats to human security and development and indeed to uh, to the very environment and climate that that that, uh, that we all depend on, and how those challenges connect and intersect. We'll hear about disruptive technology, and we'll hear about the challenges and opportunities within societies right across the world. I hope this is a conversation that is about identifying uh, common challenges and shared opportunities forward, rather than purely about those things that uh, that divide nations and divide societies. But I've said enough, and I think really the judge of this conversation will very much be you, the global audience. So let me please now introduce the, uh, the four speakers that will get the conversation started. And I think all of these names will be familiar to those of us who follow world affairs uh, with any degree of interest. Um, our first speaker in a moment I'll introduce is uh, Professor Kishore Mabulbani. Uh, Professor Mabulbani, of course, is not only a highly accomplished and distinguished diplomat uh, with a career uh, initially in the Singaporean and for many years in the Singaporean Foreign Service, including as Foreign Secretary, uh, ambassadorial positions, representative to uh, the United Nations, of course. Recording uh, stopped. Indeed, president of the uh, the Security Council as well. But of course, more recently, uh, Kishore Mahbubani's role has been much in the academic and think tank the thought leadership space. Uh, his, his work with the National University of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, but of course, right now, distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore. So let me go to you first, Kishore, and then I'm going to introduce the other speakers uh, in more detail when they have their remarks. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rory. Please let me begin by first joining Penny and you in congratulating Ambassador Gino Jalal and his spectacular team for organizing this amazing global town hall meeting that reaches all corners of the world. Uh, um, and I agree with you that we should talk about the, the future in the five minutes you assigned me. What I'm going to talk about is three big trends uh, that we should pay special attention to over the next 10 years. First, in the area of geopolitics, there's absolutely no question that over the next 10 years, we will see an acceleration of the US-China geopolitical contest. Now, I spelled out the structural reasons for this in my book, as China won. But the critical thing to know is that there's an amazing consensus in a divided American polity that the United States has about 10 years to stop China from becoming number one. So there's an amazing bipartisan consensus that we're going to need to do whatever we need to. That's why you have trade sanctions. That's why you have the CHIPS Act. That's why you have moved to restrict American investment in China. So it'll be a rough ride. But here I want to emphasize a point that Penny made, that the world faces common global challenges 
and maybe we should persuade the United States and China to tone down their contest and focus on the common global cha challenges like climate change. Second point I'm going to make very quickly is that an issue of concern, especially for Southeast Asia, is that sadly, the relations between China and India are not improving. Indeed, there are growing levels of distrust. And last night, I appeared on an Indian NDTV show to discuss the possibility that President Xi Jinping may not attend the G20 meeting. And if he doesn't, uh, it will be very sad. And for all of us in Southeast Asia, we are all aware that for the past 2,000 years, the two civilizations that have had the greatest impact on Southeast Asia have been the Chinese and Indian civilizations, the Sinic and Indic civilizations. And amazingly, even though India is further away from Southeast Asia, Indian influence is much deeper, as you can see in a country like Indonesia. So I think it's time, therefore, for the ASEAN countries to see whether they can quietly launch an initiative to improve relations between China and India, because if relations between the two get troubled, we in Southeast Asia will be affected, as I will clarify in my next point. Because the, the third point I'm going to make is a paradoxical one. Having spoken about all the dangers that we face, which are enormous, I also want to emphasize that I'm violently optimistic for the future of Asia. And this will be the Asian uh, century. I say this, by the way, already with some confidence, because when I came out with my book, The Asian 21st Century, in January 2022, Springer Nature expected 20,000 downloads. Instead, there have been 3.2 million downloads in 160 countries. I mention this because the whole world is preparing psychologically for the Asian century. And this Asian century, by the way, will be driven by what I call the new CIA. Now, CIA doesn't stand for Central uh, Intelligence Agency. CIA stands for China, India, and ASEAN. If you add 1.4 billion people in China, 1.4 billion people in India, 700 million people in ASEAN, you get 3.5 billion people. Now, among these 3.5 billion people, which is about 40% of the world's population, in the year 2000, there were only 150 million, only 150 million people in the middle class population. But by 2020, it had exploded 10 times to 1.5 billion. And by 2030, around 10 years from now or so, guess what? The number is going to grow to 2.5 to 3 billion. Now, this is the world's largest explosion of middle class populations. And I have no doubt that this is what's going to drive global growth. And therefore, to conclude, Rory, let's also be optimistic for the future. Thank you. Look, thank you for those remarks. Thank you for those remarks, uh, Kishore Mabubani. And I think uh, you, you've got us, uh, as always, off to a, um, a provocative start because there are some big, uh, some big points you make there. And I think I just flag two thoughts for later in the conversation. Um, one is, uh, is the United States alone the strategic uh, challenge to, if you like, China's growth or China's rise? Um, and I think you, you yourself have flagged that it's more complex than that, um, that we need to think about the, as I would argue, the multipolarity of the region. Um, and I think the role of India there is, is incredibly important. Uh, and others as well, uh, because I think if you look at the an Asia-centric region as an Indo-Pacific region, uh, as some would say, as a uh, as a global centre of gra gravity, it's a global it's a global region. It's it's a global question, and that goes to a second question which we may come back to, which is again about the Asian century, because a century is a hundred years, and if you look at, towards the end of this century, uh, it may be beginning to look more like an African century. So I'm I'll be really interested in questions about. Um, planning for the long term rather than looking into the, uh, you know, the next 10 to 20 years, which of course is a blink of an eye. Um, but I'm going to go to our second speaker, second presenter now, Ambassador uh, Sujan Chinoy. And of course, uh, Ambassador Chinoy is Director General of the uh, the Manaha Paraka Institute for Defence Study and Analysis in Delhi, but also the Chair of the Think20 
uh, I think, 20 India, which, of course, is perhaps a, um, a place uh, that has its moment because it's, uh, India's hosting of the G20 summit very soon, as we've just heard. And there are some fascinating questions there about what that means in the bigger strategic picture. But, of course, Ambassador Chinoy also has built on a, a very distinguished career in Indian um, foreign service, including as ambassador to Japan. Um, so, Ambassador Chinoy, Sujad, if I can turn to you, uh, interesting to, know, to give you the floor, but the question for you, which is really a question about how do we get through this fractured strategic environment and how perhaps does the uh, the role of democracy, not only in, if you like, uh, seemingly Western democracies, but democracy more generally play its part. Uh, question for you, Sajan. You're muted. Thank you, Rory. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks to Ambassador Dino also for inviting me to this uh, global town hall. I'm glad you raised that question. Uh, for me, as I look uh, at 2023 and the uh, years ahead, I see a fractured world in which uh, there are seven T's that divide all uh, geographies uh, and create friction points. These are the seven T's of trade, technology, territorial dis uh, d disputes and differences, terrorism, tenets as in narratives, values, principles, and systems of uh, governance and development, transparency, and trust. These are the 70s that are to be seen as friction points in all geographies, whether Europe or the Indo-Pacific. The main trends, in my view, that are before us, which is that there is a weakened United Nations, and a dysfunctional WTO, less of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, UN guidance uh, with regard to global issues, this is likely to continue. The war in Ukraine is unlikely to end anytime soon for the simple fact that uh, it's very difficult to defeat uh, even a former superpower on its own doorstep. There are no examples of that. There are many examples of superpowers being defeated elsewhere, but not on their own territory, in the sense, um, back home uh, in their own uh, kind of sphere of influence. Uh, Sino-US rivalry is expected to continue. Uh, and uh, we will also see rising military expenditures around the world, uh, Europe, as well as uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And the post-pandemic distress is also something that is likely to continue. Uh, for me, the uh, three main uh, sort of possibilities for major disruption, uh, black swan, grey rhino kind of events are uh, a potential uh, out-of-the-box uh, US-Russia reset. This was spoken of when uh, Trump came into power in January 2017, but uh, very soon was swept under the carpet due to allegations of interference uh, in the internal affairs of the United States. The second uh, potential big disruptor could be uh, China's uh, unilateral action in the Taiwan Strait and uh, the fact that the United States will uh, get involved, Japan will get involved, it will create uh, chaos all around. The third is uncertainty in the Chinese economy, which is already beginning to affect uh, uh, China, but also may affect uh, the rest of the world. Um, for me, I think the important thing is that uh, the only representative group today uh, that is uh, likely to be able to get uh, some job done with regard to low-hanging fruit, especially to address uh, the key questions of uh, achieving sustainable development goals. We are already at the halfway mark. Uh, looking at uh, gender equality, uh, looking to see how we can ensure uh, equitable uh, and uh, equal access to digital public infrastructure, um, and also look at ways and means to address the big challenge of climate finance, climate change. Uh, this is the G20, and India has tried to make it as inclusive as possible. Uh, I think the G20 therefore, uh, should stick to the main agenda of, uh, uh, you know, economic uh, development uh, and SDGs. And this will, in my view, feed into the summit of SDGs, which is to take place at the United Nations later this month, as you are aware. Next year, the summit of the future, uh, which will also be held in September 2024, will also look at 
uh, SDGs. So this will feed into that India's effort. Um, I think it's also important to note uh, that uh, democracies, uh, you know, there are many of varying shades. And I think uh, uh, there are elections coming up in the United States, India, Indonesia, uh, even Mexico, uh, Taiwan. Uh, but these are not likely to fundamentally alter the main trends. I would caution uh, people from also using democracy in an absolute manner because uh, there are shades of democracy. And in the global south, there are many countries that practice democracy, but a kind of democracy that's embedded in their civilizational and historical experience. So the West needs to be particularly careful in trying to build consensus um, uh, you know, and, and making sure that they do not usually use the word democracy in a fashion that suggests uh, intrusive uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, aspects to their policy. So I think uh, this is where we stand today. Uh, and uh, there should be a greater effort made within the G20 to build consensus. Uh, India is doing its best uh, uh, to bring the AU in, that's 54 countries, uh, and to make the G20 as representative as possible. The G20 is like a uh, wayside station where people can pull up uh, in a traffic jam of uh, uh, multilateralism to actually sit together and discuss the big issues before the rest of the world. So let's all work together. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sujoin. Uh, Sujan, I think a, a traffic jam of multilateralism. We can come back to that perhaps. Let's go to our third speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Jose Engel Guria. Uh, is uh, Engel Guria, president of the Paris Peace Forum, uh, but of course, uh, well known as uh, Secretary General, formerly of the OECD in 20, uh, 2006 through to 2021. Uh, so bringing obviously uh, a very profound economic perspective, but Engel, if I can go to you deeper than that and look at the role of the private sector, because we're beginning to already unpack global problems, so much of the capacity to address those problems and the responsibility, I would argue, is not all in the hands of government. So I would love to hear your views on that, please. First of all, thank you, Rory. And uh, second, um, we have to strengthen the UN. We have to strengthen the, the agencies of the United Nations. When it comes to um, making peace, companies cannot make peace. Um, but uh, I have to say at the same time that we have to understand and accept the role of private sector companies, of non-state actors, of um, it, the uh, you know uh, that the, the tech companies, for example, tech companies very very important. Uh, they have a very important role to play in shaping global development. And um, so, increasingly, these non-state actors are not taking over, but they're complementing and they're doing their own thing. Uh, and uh, let me just say, without the private sector doing its own thing in terms of, for example, climate change, well, climate change will not happen. Uh, well, well the, actually the, the fight uh, against uh, climate change will not happen. We and we will not succeed. And remember, it was a private sector which put together the first um, price of carbon coalition, huh? and who decided that they would put a price of carbon. Uh, but Rory and uh, dear friends, we sometimes forget that the greatest, most important intergenerational responsibility that we have is with the planet and that there's no 
plan B for the planet. That there's no planet B, actually. And therefore, that we have to stay the course. We have been distracted, Rory, because there was first the pandemic, and then there was the invasion. And the invasion brought inflation. And the inflation bought, you know, brought the highest interest rates ever. And therefore, and we're still suffering from that. And that, you know, the whole discussion of whether there will be a recession or not a recession at the United States, etc., as a result of the actual uh, high interest rates, which are the result of the um, inflation, which is the result of the invasion and everything else. But let's not forget the single most important intergenerational responsibility is with the planet. And therefore, whether there's a pandemic, whether there is a, an invasion, whether there's war in Europe for the first time in 80 years, uh, you know, with a, with a neighbor, yes, but that should not distract us. And let me tell you um, also that I believe companies are absolutely crucial to make things happen. For example, uh, on information and democracy. How are we going to get, you know, how are we going to rescue the quality of our democracy, which is at stake now with all this authoritarianism and all this populism? Um, we have to get the private sector companies lined up so that they will support, so that they will actually uh, help us. How are we going to get... Uh, the next pandemic under control. How are we going to address the next pandemic uh, if not uh, with the support of the private sector? Especially after having seen the, the, the disaster that was uh, in terms of equity and in terms of uh, uh, fight against poverty, et cetera, et cetera, or that was the last, uh, the last pandemic uh, when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, vaccines. So Thank there you are. Please. There you are. Sum up. Yeah. Thank you. There you are. That's, look, Angel, that's, th that's uh, I think, a really important message, and, and I think it will resonate throughout the full town hall, uh, the responsibility of the private sector. And I think um, I'm going to turn now to our final speaker in the opening panel, and that is, of course, uh, Suzanne Baris lung uh, Suzanne is president of the East West Centre in Honolulu, uh, which plays a vital role in, in a much more comprehensive understanding of Asia and the uh, United States relationship with with Asia across the board. Um, coming from a, a career that includes uh, leadership roles in, uh, in 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 US military, but now looking much more, I think, as a former major general, looking much more comprehensively comprehensively at the human picture. So, Suzanne, the, the floor is yours, and I'm interested in your understanding of the, the greater complexity of the way to really manage the challenges in the, the globally pivotal region of the Indo-Pacific, looking beyond, actually, the military dimension, looking at the economic and, and human dimensions. What are your views? Thank you so much, Rory, and thank you to our distinguished panelists and um, for the organizers of this wonderful global town hall. Great to join you from Manila today, although I would normally be in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, but I'm here meeting with alumni who are many students who have benefited from multicultural international education, which is a point I'd like to talk about when we talk about the state of the Indo-Pacific. You know, I see the state of the Indo-Pacific from a perspective that I feel I need to share because it's about perspective from someone whose roots is from this region or Kanaka Maoli from Hawaii and also a mother from Japan. So I know, um, well, it's not about me or it's not about any individual, but that perspective really colors the way in which we look at, at the region. It is my ancestral homeland and 
someone who's working with these 36 plus nations now as a leader of the East West Center on building those relations and understanding among nations and people of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific through a not just education, cooperative study, but research and dialogue, which was some of the things that was mentioned here that we have to get together and we have to have these dialogues. You know, we've heard it said by many of our speakers, distinguished speakers so far, that we really are at that inflection point in our global history. The Indo-Pacific region or the Asia Pacific, however you want to say it, is in the global spotlight. And not just because of that geopolitical strategic competition, but because of the great opportunities uh, that each of our speakers so far had said that exist, that we can all live in peace and prosperity if those opportunities are distributed equitably. You know, as it was mentioned, you know, rising out of a global pandemic, we see the impacts of climate change. And in the Indo-Pacific, more natural disasters that occur in this region than any other place in the world, increasing in its intensity. You know, even Maui, we see the impacts of the drought of the you know century, um, the worst disaster in the U.S. history in this century on Maui. Um, we see historical grievances, border conflicts, overlapping territorial claims, illegal fishing, rise in authoritarian regimes, human rights violations. Human, we've heard all of this disinformation, poor governance, challenges to the international rules and norms. And these combinations impacting the people on the ground in communities who often feel they do not have agency to make change for their generation and generations to come. However, as um, being an optimist as well as Professor Mabubani says, that diversity and economic potential growth in this region is varied. No two countries are the same, but and it's vast. The Indo-Pacific, I would say, as we all, I think, would agree, is the most consequential region of this century because of its people, its economics, and global trade potential. It is the home of half of the population. And by the way, I have to say, half of that population, no matter what country, are half women. You know, some have brought up, uh, I think the ambassador brought up gender issues, and I think that is is key and important. So thank you for bringing that up. You know, we have nearly two thirds of the world economy in this region, home to the busiest sea lanes that enable global global commerce, and home to some of the world's largest seaports. Key critical technical supply chain manufacturing minerals, untapped resources that are found in the Indo Pacific. You know, at the same time, with that rise of the middle class, there is going to be more competition for those resources, more competition that can lead to conflict and challenges to prosperity. And as a result, you know, many regional body bodies and multilateral constructs have been formed. And we talked about some of those because we believe that that collective capacity is so important. Something that hasn't been brought up that I do want to mention is the Pacific Islands. You know, this vast body, large, people say small island states, but I say large island, large ocean nations because of the resources that are there, the maritime resources available, some of them untapped and unexplored. The Pacific Islands Forum created their 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, and it acknowledges the diversity that exists among Pacific Island nations, but they all need to come together to address those challenges to their number one existential threat, which is climate change. And they come together from a place of empowered leaders to discover ways, not as victims, because that's how often they are painted, but ways to adapt and mitigate. So speaking of leaders, I believe that not only we need to create policies, constructs, and dialogues and research, but we need to invest in the next generation of leaders who can make that change. Because if we don't, we can see the exact examples of what happens when we don't. Those authoritarian leaders who like to, who perhaps prefer to line their pockets rather than ensure the, the security of the people for which they, of which who they lead. Um, we also have to really believe in those long-term investments of that next generation of change maker. Give them those skills, those values, relationships to realize, uh, to be transformative and advocate. And I understand there's many shades of democracy whatever that shade is, but the voice of the people, rule of law, justice, equity, and respect for human rights, I think are so critical. So bottom line, I will close here. I believe that if we enable that collaboration, innovation, and freedom of thought, and a movement movement towards selfless service and intergenerational and international understanding, we can move closer to a more peaceful and prosperous region for us all. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne. And I think that uh, that really previews so many of the issues we want to go into throughout this town hall. I'm going to go straight to our our five um, brilliant uh, discussants. And what I'd like to do actually is offer each of the five discussants a short opportunity of a few minutes to respond to anything they've heard uh, and perhaps identify any priorities they think have been missed. And then I'll go back after the five discussants to our um, our speakers and try to generate a bit of time as well for audience members to send in their questions. Um, so the first discussant I'm going to go to is in fact, um, I think, uh, important not only as uh, a voice in North Asian diplomacy, but also as uh, a leading voice in uh, a relatively small power, but nonetheless, a power that, that has very strong uh, traditions of independence. And of course, that is to Ambassador Ambassador uh, Engstai Khan from Mongolia, who's uh, Chairman of Blue Banner Mongolia. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Well, thank you much, uh... I would like to I thank first to thank the panelists for their presentations and for rich uh, uh, let's say contributions. They have raised many many issues. I think uh, if we focus on one issue, then we'll lose a lot of time. So I think I'd like to thank you them all for uh, focusing on these issues. Yes, uh, we we'll all agree that uh, the state of the world is raising concerns in many areas, not only in one or not, but in many areas. Increasing rivalry among the great powers is alarming. Therefore, the middle powers are expected to play a positive role, not because of uh, power vacuum, but due to the competition of their self-interests. In addressing the global challenges, these middle powers need to work, and I would like to underline this, closely with small states that form the overwhelming majority of international community, as well as with active NGOs that U.S. Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan has said, you know, qualified them as superpower there. Uh, so we have to focus more on that as well. By their very nature, small states are quite sensitive to the challenges they are the most affected and keen to find sustainable solutions uh, to the SDGs, as it was mentioned by one of the previous speakers. These are objective prerequisites, objective prerequisites for success that need to be encouraged and made practical use of. An example on the issue is also the nuclear weapons. They threaten all and thus are the concerns for all of us. Non-nuclear weapon states are natural proponents of establishing nuclear weapon free zones and, of course, the nuclear weapon free world. However, in their increasing rivalry, the great powers, including the, in, in the Indo-Pacific, expect non-nuclear weapon states to take sides in their rivalry in this sensitive for all area. That should not happen, and that should be considered as a contribution of small states to overall peace and stability. That's where we see contribution of small states on, in this area. There are nearly two dozen uh, states that due to their uh, geographical location or for violent political or legal reasons cannot be part of traditional group states or nuclear weapon free zones. That turns them into blind spots and gray areas and not actual stepping stones to the nuclear weapon free world. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank, thank you indeed. I'll, I'll, I'll just pause it there and go to our next speaker. We may revert to that issue throughout, vital issue throughout the, uh, the dialogue. I'm going to go to John's Hemmings. Um, so John Hemmings, uh, who's uh, Senior Director for Indo-Pacific and Security Policy at Pacific Forum. Uh, John, please. Thank you so much, uh, Rory. Thank you to the panel. And uh, again, thank you very much to Foreign Policy Community Indonesia for allowing me to take part in this really interesting discussion. Uh, I'll touch on three points and maybe mention one point that I think could have done, maybe could have been 
highlighted more. Even as I said, I, I, I sound not as humble as I should, but I'll put forward it humbly. I think the three points are uh, the strategic competition that was mentioned previously, U.S. China by a number of different speakers. Um, and I'd like to, you know, also explore the idea that that, in fact, that has widened uh, to some extent. Not, I'm not quite sure what the dynamics of that might be, whether, you know, China might characterize it as the United States rallying countries behind it. The United States might characterize it as countries that have been, had their own relationship fallouts with China. But um, simply, you know, to read off the, the in India, Japan, South Korea, Germany, UK, uh, Canada, any number of nations have had issues with China. And so there's a question of whether we start to see, maybe gently in post-Ukraine, that US-China conflict, um, particularly as Taiwan emerges as a prospect, we see, you know, soft factions, not Cold War factions, but soft factions. So that's one uh, area of concern and, and also just uh, responding to what people are saying. The second one was to many lateralism uh, and the idea of the United Nations. And I think, unfortunately, be, because we really need, especially with climate change, uh, we really do need uh, international responses to these things. But as we saw during the Cold War, as geopolitical rivalries rise, uh, a lot of these organizations tend, especially the United Nations Security Council, become less efficient as people compete and and uh, use the, the the forums for competition. And so I think not only are you seeing G20, but you're also seeing AUKUS and the trilaterals and a resurgence of NATO. And so the sort of traditional minilaterals and, and alliances are resurging, which, um, you know, for better or worse. And then my final point uh, is on the, the sort of rise of Asia and CIA has mentioned, you know, to some extent, the Asia Development Bank's report 2017 says that $1.7 trillion is required every year to help Asia rise. And the question is, what does that look like with AI thrown into it, smart technologies? Have we reached those sorts of numbers of investment? Um, Belt and Road seems to have fallen off. As China slows down, of course, the United States faces, faces the Ukraine-induced recession. And so even though I want to be as optimistic as one of our panelists, my, my question would be, can, can we really be that optimistic? So with that, I'll, I'll leave the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, that, that sums it up nicely, I think. And I, uh, I think it's um, appropriate at that point to uh, I put, raise that question of what are other nations' challenges with China? It's not only a US-China story, but also what are the situation, what are the circumstances inside China? And I think with that, it's a perfect moment to go to our next um, discussant, uh, Dr. Liu Qing, who's uh, Vice President, uh, Senior Research Fellow as well at the China Institute of Strategic Studies in Beijing. Uh, Dr. Liu, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, um, thanks, Mirakar. Um, I, uh, we haven't seen it for a long time, and many thanks for your attention uh, in, in uh, our thought, uh, into the discussion. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, have two points uh, and uh, two questions. And uh, first, uh, I just want to I uh, ask uh, um, Professor Kisho Madabuni. A, my question is, uh, in the context of intensifying geopolitical competition, uh, the diminishing role of the Uni uh, United Nations, uh, the weakening of multilateralism, and the rise of the bloc uh, politics, how should the international community come together to save the disorderly international uh, water? As we all know, and I, after the Second World, World War, our senior generation um, came together to build the international system based on UN Charter and the principles, and the international order based on international law. Right now, I think the all uh, are challenged, uh, are being challenged. And how could the international community come together to get get out of these uh, the difficulties and what kind of uh, basic principles uh, we should uh, stay committed to keep uh, our region or the global peace and stability and the second question I want to uh, ask uh, 
um, Professor Susan Lee Vares Long, and uh, they, we know ten years ago we I uh, talked more about uh, Asia Pacific concept, and uh, right now we talk even more, you know, uh, the concept of Indo Pacific. And uh, uh, I think different people, uh, different countries have different uh, definition uh, of this uh, concept. Uh, in terms of uh, geopolitics, now uh, this concept uh, uh, only include a uh, uh, maritime nations, uh, but exclude uh, Asian um, uh, continental Asian nations. Was a the original Asia Pacific is divided into two parts, uh, and uh, in that is uh, uh, a, well in terms of the uh, uh, view of uh, of geo uh, geography uh, geography a uh, the concept such as LIP emphasize inclusive uh, cooperation. So I think different countries have a different opinion of uh, Indo Pacific. My question is how to shape this concept so that it could uh, make the make the region more uh, inclusive and less exclusive, more collaborative and less competitive. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Liu. We'll have to leave your question there for the moment, uh, but it's, I think, useful to have those questions and interventions from a colleague in China. We've heard from uh, voices in the United States, uh, Mongolia. I want to go to our next discussant, uh, who's from uh, from Pakistan, and that's Dr. Shabana Fayaz, who's Chair of Defence and Strategic Studies at Qaidi Azam University in Islamabad. Uh, it, the floor is yours, Dr. Fayaz. Uh, Please, you're on mute. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. It's very nice uh, to see all of you and uh, sharing the floor with very esteemed and uh, seasoned people like uh, Mahabuani and, and, of course, the senior ambassadors and Suzanne uh, from Hawaii, where I've lived for about 12 weeks as well in APCSS Center. Uh, talking about the uh, world today, I feel that the world today is bleak as well as it is there are positive signs on it. And specifically about Asia, uh, uh, what we are talking about is, I think the three elements need to be looked in. What is the digital divide that we are suffering? And then it is the debt, the issue of the debt servicing. And third is the deep polarization. And fourth, but not the most important, is the uh, deep distrust. And this is very important. So these are the four things I think uh, that needs uh, the cooperation. Digital divide between the countries like the China, India, uh, Indonesia, Australia, and the others, and especially, but the dependency on the Western base of digitalization. This is something I think we need to have our own indigenous system in place and uh, and help one another, like China and others, those who are already using the different forms. Because I'm not against the West, but the problem is that if there is a digital disconnectivity, how you are going to manage the online businesses. And because the most populated world area, uh, the most of the businesses and the online work community has enlarged, and that really depends on our good servicing. And having said this, uh, I really feel another important is the issue of uh, uh, investing in human capital. We have the disproportionate wealth within Asia. We have the you know, they're looking out of the region, then your neighborhood and reaching out to the others for for the betterment. It is realistic formula, but the problem is you cannot afford to move out geographically or the region where you have the hostilities. And for this, I think the conception of security needs to be enlarged. Do we need to have a conception of security to be outside the region or we need to take along the partners who may not be friendly to you, you fear from them because of the non-state actors and others, migrations and the illegal supply of weapons and, of course, the hostile ideologies. So the basic point I would like to conclude here is, I hope I'm not surpassing my two minutes or three minutes is, 
that for the future, what we need is, we need first is to refrain and invest in the leadership. We have the youth population. And of course, the proportion of female population is large in Asia. But they remain unaccounted. They remain unpaid. They remain underpaid. So, and then we have the exploitation of human capital as well. So if we move towards that, I think we can have a better future. And last but not least, we need to depolarize our minds in a positive way, in a constructive way, in reaching out, in mixing the other formulas with the indigenous reality. Unless we continue to borrow with the fancy words of, uh, you know, democracy and others and others, we need to devise our own conceptions. And I think look within is the answer for me to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Fayaz. And I'll go to a final discussant, uh, and that, of course, is Dr. Ryo Sahashi from Japan. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And it is very, my great pleasure uh, to participate in this diversified panel. Uh, thank you very much for organizing. So um, I think uh, uh, this is a little bit strange, but I yeah, I want to concur uh, with Dr. Liu Qi from China on the point of in the past uh, question. Because I believe, you know, this is very bad if we only, you know, think in the past versus Asia Pacific. I totally agree with you, right? Uh, what, what is most important for us now, you know, living in Asia is we have to uh, understand Asia Pacific and uh, in the past are both important concepts, right? And, you know, it is very important because Japan sometimes misunderstood we only pursue uh, in the Pacific idea, uh, but this is not true. You know, we support TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership. We support Asia Pacific architecture. You know, we never uh, ignore the idea in the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific. But the most important thing is even even if we use Asia Pacific or uh, 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 in the Pacific, most important thing is rule based order is important. Right? We have to, uh, you know, uh, comply the rule we, you know, create by ourselves, right? And, you know, from that perspective, my concern uh, in the state of 2023 is economic coercion, which we have now received from China. Uh, you know, uh, because, you know, uh, of course we know the concern, right? Everybody should have concern, even including me, about, you know, uh, the Alps water, uh, you know, uh, from the home of Fukushima, uh, Daiichi, uh, nuclear reactors area. But still, you know, we have to believe that international rule and scientific knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, should be the basis of the discussion. But somehow we got a very big economic coercion. But economic coercion is not the only thing we received, right? Everybody uh, received. And in the last 10 years, we saw over 100, 100 economic coercion. But the most important thing is, I want to emphasize here is we have to uh, get over this situation always based on time, te engineering technology, uh, and also international cooperation, multilateralism, WTO, right? If not, we cannot sustain this order and we cannot sustain the internationalism, right? So uh, this is just a my short comment, but you know, I, I just want to concur with other uh, panelists, but just as final, uh, I, I believe I still have 30 seconds. Uh, my just a question is uh, just a little bit different topic, but I believe this area really needs shared leadership in coming decades, not only by United States, not only by China, right? We need shared leadership. We need coalition of middle powers. And we need coalition of civil society. But how could we envision that future? Maybe, maybe to Dr. Kishou Mahabali, but also other excellent speakers, you have your own takes on the future of uh, middle powers and civil society. So uh, this is my question. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Sahashi. And I think you've, you've really hit a key issue here. What I'm going to do is just read out three very brief questions from members of the public, from some of the global public that is tuning in to this extraordinary conversation. Then I'm going to hand the floor back to each of our four speakers and give you two minutes each for any concluding responses or remarks or answers to questions. We're not going to resolve everything here and now. It's going to be a long conversation, but thank you. 
the three questions from uh, our, 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 our viewers, one from Moreno Borgoy from Indonesia, is a question really about debt, and it's a, and it's a question pointing in particular to the uh, to whether in fact uh, Chinese uh, economic partnership necessarily involves debt, and how does that debt affect the sovereignty of uh, a country like Indonesia? The second and third questions from Purnima Vijaya from India and Devi Tama from Indonesia are both about middle power diplomacy and precisely that question of how do coalitions of middle powers navigate this era of strategic rivalry? Uh, and I'm just going to add one quick observation before I hand back to our four speakers, and that's to note this fascinating debate about the Indo-Pacific and the Asia-Pacific. I think that the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, for the viewers who are interested, provides an interesting way um, to navigate um, any false dichotomy there, an, an inclusive vision of an Indo-Pacific region. But uh, to you, Professor Mawabani, Kishore, you have the floor first. Thank you, Rory. Um, we have two minutes. <laughs> you know, the most dangerous thing in international relations is to engage in wishful thinking. We have to deal with hard realities. Let me give four statistics, which I think will answer the questions posed to me by Professor Liu and our Japanese colleague. The first statistic is that the West makes up 12% of the world's population. 88% of the world lives outside the West. This explains the second statistic. The Russian invasion of Ukraine was illegal. We should condemn it. We have condemned it. But 85% of the world's population, including India, have not imposed sanctions uh, on Russia. So Russia is not isolated. In some ways, it's the West that is isolated in imposing sanctions. Uh, on Russia. Third statistic, the BRICS combined GNP of BRICS in 1992 was half that of the G7. Today, the combined GNP of BRICS is higher than that of G7, making it clear that the G7 is a sunset organization and BRICS is a sunrise organization. And the last point, when you talk about debt, the question of debt, uh, debt trap diplomacy and the Belt and Road Initiative, the 193 countries in the world, 140 countries have opted to join the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, the reason I give all these statistics is that we can bring the world together, but we can only bring the world together if we understand and the minds of the 88% who live outside the West and who are, in a sense, going to drive this 21st century. And Rory, I agree with you. It will be an Asian century plus an African century. So let's understand what the Africans want. Also. Thank you, uh, Kishore. Let's go to Ambassador Sujan Chinoy. Yeah, thanks, Rory. Uh, let me begin with uh, a comment on the future of middle powers. In my view, the middle powers are not a single group. Uh, they have different... Uh, profiles, different geographies, different interests, different destinies. And as part of their hedging policies, it's very difficult for the middle powers really to come together as a group. Uh, they can only do this uh, to promote their interests in tandem with one of the major powers. So for me, that's out. Uh, future of uh, civil societies, I think they have a great future uh, so long as uh, civil societies do not start believing that they have uh, responsibilities that transcend uh, national identities, uh, sovereignty, uh, and uh, you know decision making that is best left to governments. As far as uh, the Indo-Pacific versus the Asia-Pacific is concerned, I think the Asia-Pacific is a thing of the past. It belonged to the latter half of the 19th century, uh, in which uh, Japan, the Asian tigers, and China grew very rapidly by accessing the one big market across the Pacific in the United States of America. This century has seen many more uh, economic uh, uh, powers emerging uh, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, as far away as Africa. So the Indo-Pacific is the more representative, more democratic, more accommodating of aspirations of a much larger, larger suite of geography and many more people. I think uh, the salience of nuclear weapons has not been discussed today except in passing, uh, but we must uh, harken back to the January 3 statement of the UN Security Council permanent members 
uh, they spoke of the Reagan uh, Gorbachev, uh, uh, you know, proposition that uh, a nuclear uh, war can never be won and therefore must never be fought. But today we have, in fact, uh, a growing salience of uh, nuclear weapons as a result of the war in Ukraine. And there are references to tactical nuclear weapons. Um, and so that's worrying for me. Um, for me, again, a big issue, and that's the last, last point. Last point, Sir John. Last point. Yes, last point, is that uh, it will be very difficult for China to achieve the China dream uh, by 2049 unless Taiwan is reunified. Uh, there are two possibilities. China does it forcefully uh, or it takes place uh, through peaceful unification. The latter is unlikely uh, at this stage. And a forceful reunification means uh, disastrous possibilities between now and 2049. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, for that important observation. I think uh, our our third speaker, uh, Engel, two minutes, please. You're muted. It used to be that. Um, you went to the Paris club in order to settle your debts. Today, if China is not a part of the Paris club or is not involved in the overall debt resolution issue, then it will not get solved at all. And simply because there are 140 to 150 billion debts uh, of developing countries, mostly Africans, because the Latin Americans have not gotten so much uh, involved, and of course some uh, are heavily uh, indebted uh, with Asia. So uh, that is a new problem today, uh, and it's a new challenge today, and China has to understand that if they really want to be a good citizen, a citizen of the world, and they want to spread their influence, and they want to, you know, have greater clout, they're going to have to deal with the question of the debt. And that means maybe another hippie debt forgiveness round, and it's going to be expensive for the Chinese, but they're going to have no choice. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, um, we will now go to our final speaker. Uh, Suzanne, you have uh, two minutes. Less is even better. Thank you. I'll be very quick. I, I do want to address the question by Dr. Liu um, about the Indo-Pacific. You know, it's all about perspective. Like I said, we have put out a series called Asia Matters for America. So surely Asia in this continent is critically important. You can look us up online, asiamattersforamerica.org. Um, but the Indo-Pacific, to me, is very inclusive of a geographic boundary. Being from someone from the Pacific, where we call the Pacific Superhighway Keala Ikahiki, which is where our ancestors traveled and connected us to the land where it originated. Also from China, you know, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, coming the Austronesian language is coming into the Pacific, including the Indian Ocean, kind of almost like the hands that wrap the ocean. So from a more indigenous viewpoint, to me, it's much more inclusive of the patterns of our ancestors who've come throughout the region. Um, and 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 the the place in which we live is in the Pacific. Um, so I, I view it a different way. Um, but of course, Asia in itself, um, the relationship to the United States, somebody like me who ancestors came from China, ancestors came from, you know, all over in a most diverse country, I believe, in the world, the United States. And um, not that it's without, you know, issues like every place else. But I think I love the fact that we have transparent dialogue about it, that we can um, uh, take a look and address these issues. And I think that superhighway along the Pacific also needs to be a verbal superhighway of dialogue that many of you on this I know so very well that that line of communication between the United States and China has to remain open and through education diplomatic needs. The trade is so very critical for both countries. Uh, you know, one of the largest import exports and and we have the, you know, the the um, 
the rise in, in the way we both countries live is because of this integrated trade. And I think we need to continue to do that. So um, with that, the last thing I do want to mention, I know I have two seconds, uh, is that we need to also look through a equitable gender lens of our world, that the women's voices need to be heard in all of these decisions. And that's, I will leave it at that. Thank you so much, Marie. Suzanne, thank you for ending on that note of, of dialogue and inclusion. And I think that actually sets a tone for the rest of the global town hall. Many problems illuminated, uh, but I think at this point, we're going to have to share our optimism, our confidence in the future back with our hosts uh, and, and look forward to the rest of the dialogue. I thank you all for your candor, uh, your, your honesty, and also your, um, uh, your, your humanity in this conversation today.